Hello, everyone. Welcome. Dear guests, dear MPs from across Europe, my name is Silja Alvarsdóttir and I work as a project manager here at the Nordic House. And on behalf of the Nordic House, I would like to thank you for coming here today and joining us on this discussion on ecocide as an international crime and the importance of creating a legal framework that will protect nature in times of war as well as times of peace. The Nordic House works according to the Nordic Council of Ministers' vision that the Nordic region should become the most sustainable and integrated region in the world by 2030. Therefore, we find it very important to provide a space and place for discussions of this kind. I will keep this very short and sweet, and therefore I will now give the word to our moderator, Pella Diel, who is an ecologist and co-founder of Anti-Ecocide Sweden, which was one of the first uh, international organizations working for ecocide law. Thank you and welcome, Pella. <laughs> Thank you and welcome here everyone and welcome also to people who are following this online and uh, to this amazing and important event which is co-hosted by Stadvum Vistmord and Ecoside Sweden, the Nordic House and Stop Ecoside International and it's held just before the Reykjavik summit of the Council of Europe which is only the fourth summit in the 73-year-old uh, history of the Council. This Council is called the, the Conscience of Europe, and uh, it has expressed the intention to reaffirm the commitment to the core principles of promotion of democracy, human rights, and the rule of law. So the whole of Reykjavik is buzzing with conversations today on these important topics. And it's really symbolic that this meeting takes place in Iceland, which is uh, the, ha having the oldest parliament in the world. Already 1,000 years ago, Icelanders gathered to strengthen and enforce the law. And now, the understanding of the need for strengthening and respecting the rule of law also for the environment is rapidly developing on the international level following the Russian attack on Ukraine. The summit also takes place in the midst of an extremely serious ecological crisis, threatening not only democracy, human rights and peace, but indeed life on Earth as we know it. It's therefore commendable that the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council has pointed out the need for heads of state and government to take the lead in recognizing the rights of a safe, clean, healthy and sustainable environment, while also supporting the drafting of a legally binding framework to guarantee this right. This seminar will explore the possible recognition of ecocide as a new international crime. We will hear from an incredible range of speakers covering the issue from a scientific, political, civil society and youth perspective. After the event, for those of you who are here in the room, there will be mingle with drinks and you're all welcome to stay for that. So first, I'm very happy to invite Jojo Meta who is uh, the chair of Stop Ecocide Foundation, and she's one of the people, or she's actually the person in the world, I would say, who is most up to speed with this incredibly rapidly uh, developing issue. And Jojo, I know that you thus have a lot to say, but uh, <laughs> please remember to not be too fast in your words. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much and good day to everyone. We're here to discuss a legal initiative that is currently gaining huge traction around the world. It's an initiative that very few people had heard of just a few years ago, but which is now being discussed in dozens of governments, in the EU, in the Interparliamentary Union, and of course, in the Council of Europe. 
I'm referring, of course, to the initiative to recognise ecocide in criminal law. This initiative could be one of the most muscular, concrete and practical ways to respond to climate and ecological crisis and also a useful framework for policymakers and industry directors alike. Criminal law is generally thought of as a framework for punishment, creating personal criminal responsibility for acts that society condemns and prosecuting perpetrators of those acts. Yes, that's how it works, but that's not what it's for. Criminal law is there to deter, prevent, and protect. Murder isn't a crime in order to punish murderers. It's a crime to stop people killing each other. Because as a society, we consider killing each other unacceptable. There are moments in history when society begins to recognize something as unacceptable and therefore worthy of prohibition in criminal law. The crime of genocide was established in response to the Holocaust, an atrocity that the world recoiled from in horror. And if we have the courage to look, we are witnessing a similar moment right now. With respect to destruction of the living world around us, the vital ecosystems that make up our common home, the earth. Genocide means to kill a people. Ecocide means, literally from the Greek and Latin, to kill one's home. In other words, it refers to mass damage and destruction of nature and puts a name to something we can all recognize as happening. I'm sure I don't need to quote the numbers or the reports to you. We have all seen them. Although for me personally, the nearly 70% decline in wildlife in the last 50 years, detailed in the WWF's Living Planet report a couple of years ago, along with the apocalyptic decline of insects upon which so much of our food supplies depend, are particularly shocking. At the same time, what we are witnessing around the world is a rising frustration with the pace of action to address the climate and ecological crisis. At Stop Ecocide International, we work with all levels of society, convening at diplomatic and UN level, as well as developing cross-sector collaborations and supporting grassroots mobilizations. And we have observed this frustration at all of those levels. Yes, there are plenty of environmental regulations in place around the world, but they are often badly followed, woefully monitored, and poorly enforced. Yes, there are multilateral environmental agreements, targets, and pledges in place. The Paris Agreement, the Sustainable Development Goals, the Global Biodiversity Framework, the Leaders' Pledge, all of them important, and if all were fully followed, would be truly remarkable. But none of them are binding. We, and I include all of you in that we, are therefore left with a very uneven playing field where genuine action on sustainability is a constant uphill struggle against a default flow of investment into business as usual. We have heard directly from agricultural companies, for example, that don't follow existing regulations and say that they find it cheaper not to tick the boxes, and they know that nobody is checking. And a large number of corporations simply don't really know what to do in the face of a crisis of this scale. It's actually verging on unimaginable for many people. And this is where criminal law can be extremely useful. And specifically, legislating for ecocide, which is to say the most severe harm to ecosystems, as an international crime, which is what our organization advocates for. And discussion of this is now on public record in at least 27 member states of the International Criminal Court, the ICC. The Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which has been meeting here today in Reykjavik, recommended in January of this year that all its 46 member states legislate for ecocide and support its addition to the Rome Statute. The European Parliament, just a couple of months ago, proposed inclusion of ecocide-level crimes into EU law. So what precisely do we mean by ecocide? 
There have been working definitions over the years, but in 2020, our charitable foundation was approached by Swedish parliamentarians asking us if we could commission a draft text that would be concise, effective, and politically practical that they could actually ask their government to propose at the ICC. On the basis of that request, we were able to convene an expert panel of 12 top lawyers from around the world with various legal specialisms and ideological standpoints. The panel was chaired by renowned barrister and author Philippe Sands, KT, alongside Senegalese jurist Dior Falso. Following a broad public consultation and six months of deliberations, the panel emerged in June 2021 with a consensus definition which runs as follows. And if I could have the slide, please, that would be great. Thanks. So ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. This definition has gained huge political traction. Indeed, within a week of its launch, well over 100 press pieces appeared around the world in major publications, and interest has not stopped growing since. And this definition has several beautiful things about it. Firstly, it's based on consequences, on the result or threatened result of the act, not on a list of the type of acts. And this is super important, as it doesn't target any specific industry, but instead refers to the severity of actual or threatened harm. And thus, it remains dynamic over time, and it is also intuitively understandable. Secondly, it strongly reinforces existing laws. One needs only to imagine how a board of directors would approach its regulatory obligations knowing that if it failed to fulfill them and threatened ecocide as a result, its members could be in criminal law territory. This will be a huge step for accountability and it will change decision making in a very positive way. Thirdly, it creates a useful lens for anyone that knows their own sector through which to consider their activities and, if need be, address strategic positive change, change that goes beyond greenwashing. You can't greenwash with criminal law. So it goes a bit deeper than paper drinking straws or electric vehicles. It prompts specific and useful questions, and that is gold dust because the miracle of our human brains is that when presented with questions, we have a habit of finding answers. It's unreasonable to expect policymakers to know what each economic sector should do to become sustainable. But it is eminently sensible, on the other hand, to give the experts within those sectors the framework they need to work it out. And it also helps that the core of the definition fits on the back of a business card, which is very handy when dealing with busy politicians. This lens factor is the aspect that the UN Climate Champions Pivot Point report last year was referring to when it described ecocide law as a driver and influencer of change. Lawyers and politicians often focus on what will happen when the law is in place, who will be prosecuted, how will it work, and so on. But the game-changing power of this law doesn't kick in at adoption, it kicks in now, when you hear about it. Because the time between now and the adoption of the law, which at the current rate we predict could be within four to five years, and certainly before 2030, that is the window for strategic positive change. And I came to this work myself from a decade of entrepreneurship, and I know that nothing spurs creativity better than a clear set of parameters. An outer boundary framework like this is a gift to anyone wanting to take action on sustainability because it levels the playing field. Those already on that path will find themselves ahead of the game. Investors and insurers can start assessing now where the safest places are to put their money and what to avoid underwriting. Of course, I mean safest financially, but I also mean safest in the real world, 
which is to say, least likely to destroy the ecosystems upon which we wholly depend. And let's not lose sight of that. This is a real-world solution to a real-world problem. Ecocide law compliant will likely mean climate safe and nature safe. It's no wonder that the international corporate governance network, an investor-led network controlling 70 trillion in managed assets, recommended in its statements to both COP26 and COP27 that governments should collaborate internationally to criminalize ecocide. You may be wondering what the procedure is for putting this law in place. It can, of course, be done at national or regional level. Belgium, for example, is working on including it in its own domestic penal code, while the EU is discussing adding it to an EU-wide directive. The Council of Europe has also begun work on a convention, which will likely include it. All three have supported, in principle, its inclusion in the Rome Statute, the governing document of the International Criminal Court, the ICC, which lists genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and more recently added, the crime of aggression. Any state, no matter how small, can propose an amendment to the statute. And the Pacific Ocean Island state of Vanuatu, one of the world's most climate vulnerable countries, is already proposing an informal working group of states to move towards this. For eventual adoption into the statute, a two-thirds majority is required. And the ICC itself is taking this conversation extremely seriously. During its 20-year anniversary conference last year, a whole section on the future of the court was taken up with discussion of ecocide as a possible fifth international crime. Indeed, inclusion of ecocide into its jurisdiction could bring the court into a whole new level of global relevance. It will also, as we shall be hearing more about from our Ukrainian colleague, address the worst damages created during conflict, damages which last well beyond the period in which people and infrastructure are being directly harmed. In this sense, ecocide is clearly a crime against peace and will be a timely and useful extension to, to the war crimes pertaining to the environment, which are already in the Rome Statute. We are seeing, therefore, a clear direction of travel here. In the last four years, this initiative has moved way faster than we expected and is accelerating all the time. So what you're hearing today is both a useful, a useful alert and a call to join in. It may even be a relief for decision makers to be obliged to abide by rules that have common sense, integrity, and the support of life built into them. To be able to say to boards of directors and shareholders that healthier approaches must be taken because activities that could threaten severe harm will become criminal. Finally, and this too we shall be hearing about today, this law will be important to the young and to future generations for very obvious reasons. It will protect the world they're growing up into and the work they will do in it. It will provide the legal safety rail they will increasingly and rightly demand and which we will all need if we are to emerge from the current crisis, not unscathed, it's already too late for that, but with half a chance of surviving and thriving on our planetary home. We've spent, we've spent hundreds of years treating nature as an infinite bank of resources and we have hit a harsh reality check. As I hope I've made clear, ecocide law is an eminently logical, necessary, and positive response to this, one that will help to steer investment and policy making in a positive direction, both for us and for the planet. Because after all, criminal law is ultimately not about the prosecutions, it's about safety. It's about deterring dangerous behavior and protecting life. And I think we can all agree that that's worth doing. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jojo, for that basic introduction and the latest developments. And it my, it's my immense honor to be able to invite Yevhenia Kravchuk, who's a member of the Ukrainian parliament and uh, a member of the delegation from Ukraine to the Council of Europe, and we know that 
There are many horrible ecocides going on all over the world, but actually what's going on in your country is maybe most most, most horrible. And uh, we want to hear you speak about that and also how come that you are now calling for international regulation of ecocide. Welcome. Hello, dear friends. So um, my name is Evgenia Kravchuk. I'm a member of Ukrainian parliament. I'm a, a deputy chair of uh, President Zelensky party, servant of the people in my parliament. Um, and I'm really delighted to be here. Um, actually, my colleague, Yulia Ovchenikova, uh, passed me this uh, invitation. And um, she's also a member of the, our delegation into PACE. And uh, she's working closely on this topic in the uh, Ecology Committee. So um, I give her warmest uh, greetings um, from, uh, uh, from Ukraine. So um, um, yes, I'm here for the Council of Europe um, Summit. Uh, Council of Europe is uh, the organization that unites now 46 countries. Last March, uh, this organization, uh, and now it's, it's the only, still the only international organization who was able to kick out Russia uh, from its membership. And I think uh, um, the summit of leaders would not be e even possible if uh, Council of Europe would not step you know, out of this, I would say, close uh, uh, circle because Russia was violating everything which is written in the um, Convention on Human Rights, like literally everything. So, um, and I'm not... as the international crime and put into the Rome Statute and into the ICC. So uh, I'm not surprised that Council of Europe is being the, uh, the first one, and actually European Parliament now has to follow and uh, to, to see what's um, going on. I'm really happy to see that um, there are so many young people here, and I've seen some interventions today in the morning when we're, when we're talking about the democracy and um, and actually, yes, the, the uh, fighting ecocide is for the young people, for our, uh, for, for, for my daughter, for, for uh, your children, um, because that's the, uh, the quality of life we want our children to, to, to live in. And um, I became member of parliament uh, when I was 34. Now we have the probably the youngest uh, average age of members of uh, parliament uh, in Ukraine than ever. Uh, the average age in my party uh, of the member of parliament is 37. Well, it was 37 when we got elected in 2019. And we have the youngest president uh, we ever had in this history of 31 years of um, independence. And um, if you have read or heard about peace formula of President Zelensky, then uh, you could find echo, word ecocide in this peace formula. Because one of the, uh, and I'll just quote how it's written in the peace formula that uh, to call and to, to act for immediate protection of the environment from ecocide. Um, I know that uh, you were expecting to uh, see something about the ecocide in this final statement of the leaders of the Council of Europe. Um, it's not there in, in the wording ecocide, but they will mention the peace formula of President Zelensky. So through it, through one of the points, ecocide will be in this uh, document. And I think this is the very important time because the focus is so huge on what's going on. Then we have this window of opportunities to knock to, to governments um, and, and to push forward for, for the international uh, recognition. I w would like to give you just few uh, numbers. I know that like, it's better to show one um, example than to give a lot of numbers, but, but still I think it's very important to understand how immense is the 
uh, destruction of, uh, um, you know, environment uh, in Ukraine? Well, first of all, almost one third of Ukraine, and Ukraine is the biggest country in Europe, is currently mine, uh, mined, polluted, and uh, it's actually, Ukraine now is one of the most polluted countries in the world with uh, mines. Over a thousand hectares of land are contaminated with the remains of destroyed facilities and ammunition, um, and more than two million hectares uh, of forests have been destroyed, burned. Um, when, in the place where the front line lies, everything is destroyed, it, no matter houses, forests, uh, anything, it, it just destroys um, everything, you know. Actually, the Russians are using these tactics of the burnt soil, so they literally ruin everything. Um, more than 1,500 tons of pollutants have been released into rivers and seas. 600 species of animals and 750 species of plants are under threat of extinction. Russians occupied 10 national parks in Ukraine, eight nature reserves, and two biosphere reserves. It's a huge number. It's 40% of all the resorts, the reserves, and national parks we have. And probably, well, I, I cannot uh, stop too long on, on that example, but if you Google Ascania Nova, Ascania Nova, it's, it's a, a biospheric resort in Kherson region, now occupied. And um, it's, uh, I mean, it's a pearl of, of, of Ukraine, um, and, and the situation is uh, very bad. <laughs> um, and I really hope also that NGOs can um, help with supporting with the people who work there because uh, we cannot finance with the state money those who are on the occupied territories because there is no safe way to you know send the money so the occupiers will not um, take them so it's, it's another thing um, that we have to discuss how to, how to help those who are staying there with the risk of their lives but to help and to uh, to still work, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a work of their life for many, many people. Um, also under a threat of destruction due to war, 16 Ramsar sites with an area of almost uh, 0.6 million hectares. 160 territories of the Emerald Network was the area of the 2.9 million hectares. 900 protected areas of national local importance was an area of 1.24 million hectares. I know it's the, you know, the numbers are huge, but um, it just imagine that uh, about the pollution with mines. The territory that is polluted with mines is as big as Austria, even bigger. So it's like good size European country, which is totally polluted um, with, with mines. Another striking example is dolphins in Black Sea. Um, if you Google, you can also find a video and pictures of dolphins uh, that die because that's thousands of them. I cannot give the exact uh, number. Um, our Minister of Ecology even stated about 50,000, but I cannot guarantee that. You know, it's 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 very difficult to count because. Uh, it's occupied as well, the, the, the territory that, which is, uh, lies too, too close, at least part, with the uh, Black Sea. And it's because of the use of military sonar by Russian warships. So dolphins are disorient, uh, disoriented and uh, they just, you know, are dying. And uh, to conclude with, um, I, I want to uh, say that it hasn't started with the 24th of February of 2022. It has started in 2014 with the annexation of Crimea and the start of war in Donetsk and Luhansk region. It's been going out for nine years. And Crimea, if you would look to the old pictures, it used to be a tourist place. And Russians made it a military base. They ruined national parks with putting uh, the war machines there. You can see the, the pictures with swords uh, from, from the satellite, how they put in the national parks. And 
it was always uh, a militarization because they needed Crimea to occupy other parts of Ukraine. They went through Crimea to Kherson region and to the south of, uh, of Ukraine. So uh, the only way to stop this is to kick out Russians from our country. And that applies to anything, to the rapes, to uh, death and, and killings of civilians. The only way is to kick out occupiers. And we're really thankful for the world community with this help. Thank you. Thank you so much, Evgenia, and thank you for coming here and, and uh, keeping us involved in your suffering. And uh, we have an incredible panel to reflect. I want to invite uh, Professor Vala Ragnarsdottir to sit beside Evgenia. Vala has a very long CV. She's um, the Professor of Sustainability Science at the University of Iceland. She's a Club of Rome member and a distinguished fellow of the Schumacher Institute. I want to also invite two Icelandic politicians. Um, now I will have your name right. Hanna Katrin Fridriksson, <laughs> who is... Uh, um, Member of the Parliament for the Liberal Reform Party, and Andres Inge Jonsson, you are a member of the Parliament for the Pirate Party. And then we have Magnus Haller Jonsson, who is an organizer, organizer with Stödvum Vistmord, the Icelandic branch of Stop Ecoside International, and Tova Lindqvist, <laughs> who is the co-lead of the newly established Youth for Ecocide Law and also leading the Nordic and Baltic Youth Council on Climate and Environment. Wonderful to have you all here. And I will take my seat here again. Yeah. Am I? Uh, can we hear you? Yes, wonderful. Uh, can we hear me? Um, Vala, from your perspective as a scientist, is a new crime of ecocide a necessity, or are there other policy measures that we could take? Well, as a scientist, I, did, I wasn't aware of the sustainability crisis we were in until a little over 20 years ago. And then I started thinking about what can we actually do to um, shift our world toward, towards being sustainable. Because what environmental sciences are good at, we go out and measure and we monitor and we describe the, the <laughs> decline of nature. But that's as far as it goes. And scientists have through the ages not been very good at turning their findings uh, into a language that policymakers understand. And indeed, my colleagues were furious when they started to have to explain why the science they were undertaking was important for, such, for society. That has changed now, but this, this was the general view about 20 years ago. And then, as a systems thinker, I understood that everything is connected. So a decline in nature uh, means that is, we are actually uh, undermining life, our life of, of, on this planet, because everything is interconnected. And the months, the, the economy that we rely on is 100% dependent on nature, and this has now finally been established in a big report by Das Gupta, a British economist, in 2021. But it's not until the economists speak that the politicians start to have, have an interest. Now, and that is a fact, because um, the neoliberal thinkers that promoted the neoclassical economy from the 1940s and grabbed Ronald Reagan and, and Margaret Thatcher to to promote this policy, which has now taken over the world, and is actually the engine which is destroying our planet. 
Um, they were very, very clever to position themselves as advisors to governments, of being the most important people to consult. Now, where can we then intervene in the system, which, we, which, which is actually man-made? And I thought about this uh, for a long time, and it wasn't until I met Polly Higgins, who was the first person to uh, try to get international law into the Rome Statutes that we, were talk that we were being told about, that I realized that this was actually the one step we could take that would make the big difference, which would slow down the momentum of this monumental ship that we are on, which is at the cliff, running into the cliff. Because um, we can intervene in systems in different ways. And what we have mostly been doing is trying to change the parameters. Uh, let me talk about this. It takes one more minute. <laughs> we can, we can um, change the parameter like taxes and subsidies. We've been doing that, but nothing has changed. We, would, we can try to change the feedback. So we, we try to uh, regenerate forests, you know, but th this is very slow. Uh, we can try to change the designs or the rules, you know, and, and actually ecocide law would change the rules. And now it could, go, it could go even deeper into the system to change the intent, uh, change the paradigm that we live according to. And that is actually what we need. The paradigm we live in today is killing the future of our children. And we need to change the paradigm and we can actually most easily do that with ecocide law so that our uh, children and, and grandchildren and future generations have a chance on this planet. Thank you. That was really beautifully and neatly put systems thinking around the ecocide law. So, uh, Hanna, Katrin, you're not just a member of the Icelandic Parliament, you're also a member of the Nordic Council. And we have heard both that the Nordic Council has the ambition for the Nordics to become the most sustainable region in the world. And we have also heard about support from the Council of Europe and the European Parliament and many others. So I wonder, I know that this concept has been brought up in the Nordic Council. How, how is the work going there? Uh, I think we can say we've started the journey, but we haven't reached the end. Uh, and it's true that environmental issues uh, and, and, and climate issues have been for a very long time uh, in the forefront of the work within the Nordic uh, Council and uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers as well as in the Nordic countries. Um, and um, in terms of this particular issue, the ecocide uh, lawmaking, we had a proposal uh, from the, our sustainable committee within the Nordic Council in 2021 uh, regarding the ecocide and taking off this, you know, moving this into and, and encouraging uh, individual governments within the Nordic countries to, to take off this legal framework. Um, and it didn't, uh, it wasn't accepted. I mean, it, it, more, more, it wasn't denied either, it didn't go anywhere. It was, we have this middle path that says, you know, we need to look closer into this and, um, and then something happens or hap doesn't happen. And, uh, and in this case, it didn't really. Uh, in the meantime, though, we had, uh, uh, there was a summit in Stockholm in 2022 with the youth organizations within the Nordic that uh, encouraged uh, the Nordic Council of Ministers to do something out of this. And this was one of the proposals from the young people and they were really strong in their message. So I know that that was heard, uh, but I don't think that we have a formal uh, proposition from the Nordic Council of Ministers yet. Uh, and then I joined the Nordic Council uh, in the beginning of 22. And uh, I know that what has happened since on that platform is that uh, the party group that I belong to with my party is the, the Mitten group and uh, the centre party groups, they have made an uh, individual parliamentarian's proposal 
uh, and they're trying to speed things up so they don't use the word ecocide but more uh, environmental crimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm not fully convinced that that's necessarily the, the case. We know it so often that people tend to avoid a, a certain frame or, or using of concepts and it can be both positive and negative to do that. I understand we want to speed things up but also we don't want to confuse people. Let's just use it as it is. We need a legal uh, framework. We need to move this out of some administrative legal framework where we encourage people or else, you know, and just have it under the umbrella of criminal laws if we really and truly want to change the behavior of people, of corporations, of politicians, of governments. Then call it as it is. Um, and, but this is where we're at now. But I also have to add, if I may, because uh, <laughs> taking up while on this, uh, <laughs> because the Nordic Council has now for a year and a half worked very closely with the Baltic Assembly. Uh, on the issues that have to do with kind of how we can work together in helping Ukraine uh, in the, those horrible times. So I, I just, if I may, say that if that is the case, uh, that Ukraine is really putting this on the table as one of the issues that have to do with the peace uh, propositions, uh, then it helps us. It, not only, it, it, you are helping us here. So thank you for that. Mm. This is what we are going to take up, for example, when the presidium of the Nordic Council uh, meets in a month. Mm. So that's all we yeah. Thank you for making that clear. And thank you. We, are, we have to cheer you on then in the Nordic Council. <laughs> and uh, I know that your party supported the, the proposal that Andres, uh, your party, made a few years ago in the Icelandic Parliament, which was well received and supported. And I wonder if you can just... Um, Tell us about that. What, what was the motivations for you and for the Icelandic Parliament to support the ecocide law? Well, first off, it's a proposal that was put forward by members of four parties in the Icelandic Parliament. So that's half the parties that we have represented and really shows uh, wider support than we maybe would have uh, first imagined we could get. But then what followed was, it was almost like a, uh, like a concrete example of how politicians uh, tend to underestimate uh, the ambition of the public. The public isn't afraid of radical, creative, and fair solutions to big problems. Uh, and when we brought this proposal on uh, the recognition of ecocide out, uh, we thought, oh, wow, th this is a, like a new framework for an international law. It will go like way over everyone's head. But Whenever we faced people with the discussion, everyone was like, ah, right, yeah, makes sense. Would it be like this dam that ruined the pristine highland, or would it be like when the military base in Keflavik polluted these water wells? Everyone had this uh, example from their proximity that where they had personally experienced environmental injustice. So the discussion was halfway there when we began it. All we needed to do was say, it's exactly like that, but on a bigger scale. That's basically what Ecocide is. It's, it's this uh, collective uh, experience of injustice uh, scaled to, to like a multi-country scale. So uh, the public was with us whenever we, we uh, went out in the field and, and were introducing the idea. Uh, and since then, uh, we've had uh, the issue of whaling put very clearly in the context of ecocide. So people fighting against Iceland uh, whaling commercially are pointing out that it's not really Iceland's decision on a shared stock that's doing valuable services for the whole world. Uh, and then more recently we've had the situation in Ukraine uh, highlighting, especially at the top level, we can see ministers in the Icelandic government really taking on the concept of ecocide. They're, they're using the word, even if they're not pushing it on the agenda within the Council of Europe, maybe that's too tough, too much of an ambitious step right now, but just having prime ministers using the word ecocide mm -hmm. in relation to what's happening in the world is a step in the right direction. So basically what we have is a very positive policy experience with introducing this just a year ago, 
and now we're at a place where the uh, government, having been referred our, our proposal, I'm very positive it will do something with it uh, sooner rather than later. Uh, yeah, and that's, that's basically uh, the result of our, our uh, collective effort within half of the parliament. Yeah, thank you. And I think it's so interesting that all of those efforts on all places of the world are really helping the whole. Like, we can't do it without those initiatives. Yeah, and, and we're always standing on each other's shoulders. Yeah. Uh, the proposal yeah. we put forward, there's nothing new about it. We were basically doing what they did in Belgium two years earlier. But uh, we're, we're fighting for a collective future around the globe. Yeah. So, of course, we just use what works in one place yeah. in another place. Yeah. And often I find that, uh, like, we all have ecocides happening in our backyard, and civil society is very important and often taking the leadership in this field. So, Magnus, I wonder, as an organizer within Stadvum Vistmord, um, what, what drives you, what motivates you? Why, why are you putting your time and your resources into this work? Yes, um, well, I think this law, this legal reform, appeals to me and many others on various levels. It's, uh, I think, a shared, or I like to think it's a shared trait among Icelanders that we have a strong sense of justice and, um, and ecocide abroad sort of touches some sort of injustice feeling that needs something to be done about it. But um, also from a purely uh, self-centered level, if you will, it's, it's a tool which assigns value to nature just as it is. It's so often been nature has assigned value only when it produces some sort of economic benefit. Mm. But uh, yeah, the potential of this law to assign value to healthy, unspoiled nature is tremendous and will hopefully, um, you know, stop uh, sort of this lackadaisical monitoring of, of uh, all kinds of practices which have something to do with the environment in Iceland. Um, yeah, and also if you think of Iceland in the context of the North Atlantic, not, we've heard it now in this military context of security for the North Atlantic, but it's also, the North Atlantic is a giant ecosystem. And Iceland depends on the health of the North Atlantic. And like what Vala said, literally everything in Icelandic society depends on the health of a healthy ecosystem, from the most abstract things like uh, Bitcoin mining to, to real agriculture and everything. <laughs> it all depends on you know, the renewable energy, which depends on the water, it's, it's uh, yeah, the healthy ecosystem is really the base for everything. Yeah. Thank you for <laughs> pointing that out. It's so <laughs> silly that we need to say that, but we do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much. And we heard that youth, Tova, was uh, yes. a very important voice for the Nordic Council and also towards the Stockholm Plus 50 conference that both you and I were very mm. involved in. Uh, what's happening, Do you, from your perspective, what's happening with ecocide law? We have heard that a lot is happening fast. Do you think it's enough? Uh, not fast enough, <laughs> obviously. We're sitting here today. But just, I just want to give you some context first. So basically for the youth movement, an ecocide law is more like a reassurement. It's a reassurement for life on Earth. It's a reassurement of a, of a safe uh, future. Like sometimes we forget that it's actually about our future, our lives. So that is basically what it is uh, for us. And we have now had about 50 years of multilateralism for climate and environment. And I mean, even that is not enough, you know? I mean, yes, we have had amazing agreements that you, Jojo, talked about. Um, we have had great international cooperation, 
But it is not enough, obviously. <laughs> Again, we're sitting here right now. And so uh, the consequence for this is that youth all around the world are losing faith. They're losing faith in decision-making processes, in our decision-makers, in democracy. I mean, this is very serious. We're, we're left behind and we have nowhere to, to go since we don't trust the system anymore. Uh, so when I heard about Yuxai Law for the first time, I was like, wow, this is the first time I actually feel hope. This is the first time I actually believe that there might be a solution, finally. And I am not the only one. Uh, youth on a Nordic level, on an EU level, and on a global level are actually advocating for an Ikuside law in various UN meetings. We have had so many different consultations. It's always one of the main demands, and it has been for the several last uh, years. Uh, and when we look upon Stockholm Plus 50, someone mentioned Stockholm Plus 50 here, and I, I just want to address it again. We consulted with thousands of youth from all continents all over the world. And the main demand was an Ikuside law. And we pushed it uh, in the plenary session uh, for all member states. We pushed it in UNIA. Uh, and we pushed it, as you mentioned, uh, for the Nordic uh, ministers in a meeting with them. And at that time, that general secretary, she actually promised us that uh, you would keep the the Ikuside law on the political agenda. But still nothing. It's silent. So where is the accountability? I mean, this is where we lose faith. Uh, and so I would like to say to our decision makers out there, to civil society, to everyone who is working for this cause, that we actually need to be brave and we need to be braver. And we as youth, we're everywhere. We're on, a, we're on a grassroots level and we're organizing. We started Youth for Ikside Law, which is a global movement. Uh, and we represent actually right now all the continents, which is great. We're in all the UN meetings for climate and environment. We're doing everything, but we're screaming so loud that our voices are almost not here anymore. So, we cannot have 50 more years of this. That's my main message. It is not enough, uh, and we have a solution right now, a more transformative, binding solution. What's more to get? So my, <laughs> my favorite quote, quote of all times uh, to decision makers is, step up or step beside because we youth, we actually know what we want for our future, and we're ready to step up. Thank you. Thank you all. A hand for the whole panel, I think. <laughs> and for all of your work that's been so important. And Eugenia, I know that you are going to leave us for very soon for the Council of Europe meetings. And uh, we have heard, and I really also feel that in your situation, which words are too small to, to describe, that you are actually by raising the issue of ecocide, by raising the need for international legislation on this area, you're helping all of us. So I want to, I want to know if you have any reflections from hearing from all of those voices and also how can we help you? Um, what I truly understand that we share the same values. And that's uh, why we fight. We fight for the values. Um, and Today, the panel, the, the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Iceland said that Iceland is so far away and Nordic countries are also, you know, more far away than, for example, Poland, uh, which borders or like, you know, at least uh, Baltic states. But still, uh, we do fight for the values you stand for as well. And I want to repeat uh, that using the terms and, and raising this issue about the ecocide, which is happening right now in Ukraine, and the Russia is causing it, is the way to bring it to light mm -hmm. and to push it further. This is our uh, chance. And another thing, I mean, uh, during this Council of uh, Europe uh, meeting of the leaders, that will sign the first legally uh, by the document for the register of damage that 
Russian aggression cost to Ukraine. And I'm sure that crimes against environment will be there in this uh, register of damage. The, the, you know, the sums are enormous, but I think that also we need to understand that the accountability has to come afterwards. Because if accountability doesn't happen to any of the, uh, you know, crimes against the environment, whatever you call it, then in other corners of the world, either a tyrant, another tyrant will start uh, burning the, the land, killing people, killing animals, killing species. Um, or, you know, it will happen during the peacetime as well, due to the business as usual. So the accountability has to come. Yeah. Thank you. I really would like to, to stay until the end, but I have to, to go to the closing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank, Thank you. So we will soon open the floor for pub, um, questions from the audience. But first, I just, I'm just so curious. I want to ask you, Jojo, but also any one of you. It seems like there is like a amazing support. And like the, the least thing we should actually do in this situation we are in is, is uh, having ECOSI recognized as an international crime. So, where are the obstacles? Where are the barriers? Why isn't this, why isn't this talked about in every meeting? I think this is a brilliant question and I'm asked quite often by especially by journalists. They say, where's the resistance? Where are the obstacles? And it's an interesting one because on, on one, in, in the public arena, they don't tend to appear because it's such an obvious, as we've been hearing in so many different ways, it's such an obvious rule to put in place that nobody wants to be seen to be directly objecting. So, you know, we predicted this about three years ago, but I think we're now at the point where no government is going to be heard saying ecocide should not be a crime. They're not going to say that because they're going to look terrible. And so what we tend to get is perhaps, um, oh, well, you know, we can look at different ways of phrasing it. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we can, you know, delay it a bit. Or we can, you know, uh, we know it's coming, but we don't know if we're ready yet. You know, all of these kinds of things. But what I think that shows is that there is, you know, there is this direction of travel. It is just a question of time. And it's about, so what, what we see ourselves as doing at Stop Ecoside International and, 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 and any of the, the um, national campaigns around this, I think is accelerating the inevitable. Um, now, of course, behind closed doors, there may be, you know, uh, corporate lobbyists who don't want this. But again, they're not going to say it in public. I mean, if you've just spent millions and millions greenwashing for 20 years, the last thing you're going to do is come out in public and say you don't want this law. So actually, you're going to stay very quiet. Mm -hmm. Now, what that means is that the more that this conversation is kept in the public space, the faster it goes. And we almost can't keep up <laughs> with how fast this conversation is growing now. Wow, thank you. Any of you other people? Yeah, Hanna, Christine, do you find, do you find resistance? No, no, I mean, this is an excellent question and an answer as well. And I think this is, uh, you know, the, the danger that we will kind of take too much time in kind of navigating in between and, and, and figuring out a way to say it without saying it and do it without doing it. And, but, um, but if I try to reflect maybe the, 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 some of the worries that politicians do have, whether they are sincere about it or, you know, trying to kind of fade it out if the question is, in, is uh, the, the emphasis on, uh, on ecocide compatible with economic growth. And, and it's, a, it's a valuable question and we need to answer it. Mm. And I, I, I personally think that the, the, the the answer is easy. I mean, one of the things that we absolutely need to have in order to show economic growth is healthy ecosystems. And if you don't have that, I mean, we can forget about the rest. But this is something that I think uh, we will have discussions about, and that's where the, 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 the resistance will come from, those big corporations. And we, we need to have the answers there as well, mm -hmm. and talk the talk there as well. And But I have 
I'm not worried about it. I think that we will, and it's very easy to, to argue that. Uh, if we don't have economic growth, if we don't have our world. Thank you. Anders. Yeah, I, I, I'm just thinking about the people that were the most negative when we put the proposal mm -hmm. forward here in Iceland. They always came back to the, the word, the, the mm -hmm. Icelandic word for ecocide is vistmorð, uh -huh. ecological murder. It, it's very dramatic, it's provocative. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but it's also clear. But, but people are like, can we find a softer way to say it? <laughs> <laughs> and we were always, okay, if, if, you have a, if you have a word that, that encapsulates the, the scale of the problem we're trying to put into words, be my guest. But no, no one had any solutions because what we're describing is just not a good thing. We cannot make good words to describe it. Uh, but I think this comes back to uh, what Tova was saying. Uh, young people have lost faith, not just in, in politics when it comes to environmental issues or human rights, but just politics in general, because we still have a whole generation of politicians around the world that thinks that uh, fighting for a livable planet is something radical. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and that when we're doing that, we have to make sure we, we don't provoke people with our words. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're, just, we're beyond that. And uh, I mean, I don't want to be ageist. I'm, I'm probably allowed <laughs> since I'm, I'm a bit older than, than Tuva. But part of the problem is uh, young people are losing faith yeah. because policymakers are too old. Yes. And, and they're too outdated. Mm. I mean, we heard how the Ukrainian parliament has an average age of 37. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got an international club of parliamentarians, the Interparliamentary Union, which has a youth wing, uh, which accepts anyone that's under the age of 45. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in, in the global club of parliamentarians, you're youth if you're 45 and under. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's not a healthy parliamentary system. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, I want to open the floor. Do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, the information. We have any information. Do we have any questions first, maybe? Yes, it, it will be a question. Okay. <laughs> you will have a you will have a mic. Is that this, uh, a council, uh, constitutional council, which makes new constitution and to put forward in one article about Icelandic nature. The first sentence was this, Icelandic nature is sacred earth, period. But we lost by one vote within the council. We had an article about Icelandic nature and we had a referendum in 2011, 67% of Icelanders were favored the new constitution. Since then, nothing has happened. We have the same constitution that has origin from the year 1849, and was Danish then. This is a situation in Iceland. So qu the question is, what can we do with all the others to change this? <laughs> it's a question for Hanna, Katrin, and <laughs> Andres, I think. Do you want to respond? Well, the standard question is, you, we, we have to vote better politicians in. <laughs> because uh, we've had immense public support for changing the constitution in Iceland. But uh, the majority of, of parliament hasn't uh, reflected that uh, sense of the public. And what Omar mentions about uh, the rights of nature that was put into the draft constitution is also an excellent example of how good ideas flow between countries, because when this was written in 2011, it wasn't the invention of Icelanders to put it into a constitution, but it was drawing on the experience of other countries, especially in Latin America, that in the years previously had done the same with good results. Uh, but now we're falling, we're, now we're 20, 30 years behind them rather than 10, 20 years like we were back then. So they are better at voting than we are? Sometimes they are, <laughs> yes. It sounds counterintuitive to me. <laughs> so, 
um, it means that actually the only country having rights of nature in the constitution is Ecuador still. Mm -hmm. So you could be the second. Mm. That would be something. Yeah. 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 Okay. Oh, Magnus, did you want to uh, comment? Okay. Uh, Micah. Hey. Um, hey. I think everyone knows my question. <laughs> Or at least the, those of you who, who know me. Oh, there um, are so many viewing this from all over the world. They don't sorry. know you. We don't all you know you. Please. No, I was joking. <laughs> um, no, my, question, my question is quite simple. It's about whales. And we are here in Iceland. And Iceland is now in a big discussion about whether to allow one man here in Iceland next month to go out and kill 150, 60 fin whales. And that, you know, for me, that's a form of ecocide. If you look at Ralph Chami, who has given a value to large whales for their carbon sequestration, he values them at $3 million each just for that. And so that's a half a billion dollars to the planet of, of damage. And, and I don't like to look at nature in those terms, and I, I think most of us probably don't. But it gives you a sense, you know, if we're talking about ecocide and damage, that's, that's an extraordinary level of damage, in my opinion. And I'd love to hear what everyone else here thinks about what's happening here in Iceland, uh, particularly because the Prime Minister has said that she supports ecocide legislation, but it feels a lot, you know, to me of like, somebody on the panel mentioned, we all have ecocide in our countries, you know, and maybe we all support ecocide legislation, but maybe we're not willing to actually do anything about the ecocide that's in front of us. Mm. Yeah, it's, um, if I may just shortly, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent question about a um, uh, topic that is really hard to, to, to understand uh, why the situation is as it is. As it is. And, uh, and I know that, for example, in the parliament of Iceland, there is an overwhelming majority starting this, uh, as well as uh, within the nation itself. But this is, seems to be a self-preserving um, situation and has to do with uh, um, oh, Andres. <laughs> I'm trying I, I, to be I'm polite. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I don't have to be polite. You don't have yeah. to be polite. No, it, it's really... Uh, it comes across as sort of the shameful pandering to the whims of an eccentric millionaire. And that's truly what it is. And it's just, uh, it's, he pertains that it's his right to whale, hunt whales. He, who he, is it one person? Yes, it's one person. It is. Christian yeah. Loftsson. He is the only whaler in Iceland. And he has, is immensely wealthy. He doesn't need to whale. He was able to keep the whale boats in the harbor for, how about 30, 20 years without, you know, with just losing money. And now he pretends that he needs to whale to continue to make money. It's just nonsense, really. It was maybe, you know, maybe pertinent once, but not anymore. Yeah, Vala, do you want to comment? Yes, um, first I have to take, take a deep breath. <laughs> um, <coughs> whales, now there is new scientific evidence, go down to the depths of up to three kilometers, eat krill and fish, depending on the type of the whale, come up to the surface and leave their, leave their um, excrements with fertilizers phytoplankton, and it's the phytoplankton which are the, are the bottom of the food chain in the sea. So the more whales, the more fish, the more live in the oceans. And now that we have overexploited the, the oceans by uh, more than 80%, it's totally crazy to continue uh, this whaling. And that the government is actually with the new scientific evidence and the new revelation which came out yesterday that he's actually uh, losing billions of kronas per year on the whaling, 
it's crazy that they don't have the courage to stop it now. And uh, whaling, uh, if you think about all the life it sustains in the oceans, and whales either live in the high um, Atlantic or uh, near the equator or near the equator and down to the South Seas on the planet, um, they are affecting the whole ecosystem on the planet and the amount of oxygen we have to breathe on the planet. You could perhaps say that roughly every other breath we take, we take is because of the whales. So we, we should definitely not continue this. Very, okay. very, very briefly, short. Pella. Yeah. <laughs> to answer Micah's question semi-directly, I think uh, Ecosite is an extremely useful lens to look at whaling through. Uh, with all the ecosystem services that, that whales provide for the planet. But the, the basic way of thinking that Ecosite brings is even more useful of viewing the planet, viewing uh, plants, viewing animals, not as something to service the human race, but as an, uh, as an end to themselves. Mm. Um, and recently we had a report come out in Iceland that showed what an incredibly long amount of time it takes to kill each animal. Uh, so just the, the individual suffering of each whale should be enough. Just as uh, damaging an ecosystem should be enough, even if it doesn't cause any economic damage to human beings. Uh, so I, I think in, in, in two ways we can use uh, what Ecosite brings us to, to view whaling, and it always yields the same results. I mean, no matter how we look at whaling, we have to stop it. Magnus, last comment. I just wanted to bring it back to um, the sort of the idea of the resistance against Ecosite, and this example is a very good example. It's, tiny, it's a tiny example. It's one man who'd been infringing on the rights of one man to kill all these whales. And uh, but in doing so, somebody would have to take responsibility. And I think that seems to be a very, uh, nobody wants to take concrete responsibility or assign responsibility to a guilty party for some sort of ecocide. And I can imagine, I'm not in politics, but I can imagine that this is one of the largest sort of forces of resistance. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for bringing that up. I think it's, it's a horrible example, and it's a beautiful example because like, it's, a, it's a small situation that sort of mirrors the whole. Like we can, we can, there are no excuses, there are no, def, no way to defend this. It's insanity, and in a way that's also the case for what we're doing on a planetary scale. We know now that it's insanity, and we just have to stop it. So, any other questions? Yes, Hi. welcome. I have a question. Um, yeah, it was mentioned that um, a healthy, that, that economic growth relies on healthy ecosystems. And I think by now we know that this is a contradiction in and of itself, that um, if we really think that we can live that way, that every year we, we have more of everything, um, I think that that doesn't make sense, and I was wondering whether the whole discourse around um, the ecocide legislation um, can can bring in the discourse around degrowth, and and to really like combine these these topics and and foster a systemic change, and not only advocate for another law. And I know it's a significant law and an important law, and I really understand its potential. But um, I think the importance of a of a systemic change of our entire economic system that and there might be a potential that this comes with it but I think we really need to bring this into our imaginations how can our lives look like without economic growth and what what idea do we have of of economic wealth and I think this is also a very interesting question Iceland here uh, since yeah you're enjoying uh, your wealth um, I know only for a few decades but um, I think it's all like Iceland has a huge potential in, in going and in pioneering this as well and in, in showing that that a rich country can can um, lead the way um, with with modeling other other futures of like not being so obsessed with 
with being fucking rich and having more and like <laughs> accumulating stuff and yeah, like not to not like um, satisfy our longing for resonance in this world with with having things, but like but focusing on the quality of relationships that we that we um, that we have with with each other and with the natural world. Yeah, thank you. So that's really interesting. There is actually today a conference on the growth starting in Brussels. So you're asking about the intersection between ecocide law and economic growth. And I know that, Vala, you have a whole report on economics and ecocide law. What do you want to say about this? Yes, so um, in the last uh, year plus, I was writing reports within Ecocide Sweden, one on ecocide law and the Paris Agreement, how ecocide law would help us reach the Paris Agreement. And then also ecocide law for an economy within planetary boundaries, because we, the, it, it's absolutely clear that our economy has to change. Um, and ecocide law uh, could help us shift it from focusing only on economic growth, which is based on um, uh, natural resources, as the folk, that's the basis of the current ecosystem, uh, economic system, and with uh, exponential population growth and, and exponential rise in, in, in consumption, uh, we ha also have expo exponential rise in the use of natural resources and exponential rise in the deterioration of our ecosystems. So we need to absolutely stop this grow, growth uh, chasing and, and develop a new economy focusing on the well-being of people and planet. And that is already under discussion today and tomorrow in Brussels, how a new economy uh, needs to recognize the limits to growth. And I, I heard that the, the, the uh, Van der Leiden, when she opened the conference, was building her uh, introductory speech on limits to growth, which was published by the Club of Rome, of which I'm a member, 50 years ago, and we still are focusing on growth. But it, the, the uh, post-growth um, uh, discussion is already in Brussels and elsewhere. Mm. Thank you. Jojo. No, you go ahead and I'll... Hey, um, I was, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, one of the reasons I believe that this... Um, movement, and it has become a movement, hasn't it? I mean, you know, for Ecoside Law, over the last few years, it really has um, spread to all sectors and, and all geographies on the planet. And I think one of the reasons that has, one of the things that has enabled that to happen is how incredibly, surgically precise it is. It's criminalized the worst harms to nature. It, that's it. You know, that is, that is what we campaign for, that is what all, all of our groups campaign for, and, it, and of course what we're seeing through this discussion is how broadly that impacts on other areas, you know, within society. But my personal feeling is that what we talk about is criminalising ecocide, and that is the only thing we talk about, because actually that is going to support you know, so many other things, and it, it has, you know, paradigm-shifting impacts, it has ec economy-shifting impacts, it has so many different impacts. But by being that kind of surgical, it's almost like a piece of acupuncture. You know, you get the right point in, <laughs> in a sort of energetic system, and the whole system feels it. So, and, and I think one of the reasons that it's so um, sort of simple in that way is that it is possible, it is possible to do this within the system we have. We just add an extra crime to the list of international crimes. It's completely doable, it's been done before, everyone can see the reason for it. And once that is in place, then there are potential ramifications and so on. It's a potential, you know, it's a game changer, it's a system changer, but at the same time, it can be done within the existing system. So it's kind of like a bridging piece if you like. So personally, I never make any particular comment about, you know, what economic system we should or shouldn't be using. You know, I just say, look, let's put this law in place and see what happens, because actually it's going to protect everything. Um, so, so, yeah, I think, I, think, um, I think it does very much cross so many different areas, but it's also very important 
that it is one singular thing and one singular doable, achievable thing. And I think that is what, what we see kind of lighting up people's faces with some kind of hope. And yeah, that's kind of what I wanted yeah. to say. Thank you. Tova. I lost my thought. I, I, I got so engaged by that. I was like, oh, yes, yes, yes. But I love the thing that you say about uh, that it's within our system already, or it will be, of course. And that will make us creative. That will make us, like, we have to be circular. And not only that, we have to change our values. We have to redefine our relationship to nature and not feel like we stand over it that we talked about. Like the anthropocentric era will be over, basically. Because we have no choice. We have to be creative then. When we made that step or when we have added an ecocide law. So that is something I, I really... That was a really, really nice <laughs> thing you said. And some... Sometimes I hear like grown-up people saying to me like, yeah, but we want to secure a, a, a good and secure future for you, economically wise. And I'm like, the youth doesn't want that. We want to redefine the measurement for well-being. Like, we, we need uh, poverty to end, but we don't need the growth. We don't want the growth. So uh, <laughs> I just wanted to add that. Thank you. It's beginning to become time to wrap up this amazing conversation. So I want to end by asking you all to shortly say something about, we have heard the importance about this conversation staying alive and growing. So what would you, what would you ask people to do? What's important? What message do you want to send? How can we help this acupuncture point, point to come in maybe, I don't know, five years' time or five months' time rather than 50 years. What do you say, Tova? First of all, uh, get to know the word ecocide. If you're not familiar with the word ecocide, just, you know, read about it and then talk about it. Because uh, when you do, you realize that it becomes a buzzword almost. And it spreads so fast. I mean, it's, it's on a very, very high political level, but at the same time, people can relate to the word. That's why it's so, so powerful. So uh, start there and then of course engage. And of course I want to say to all the youth in this room and on the live stream that if you're interested to join, uh, search on Youth for Exide Law. We have Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you name it. And please, it's not too late to engage. So if you want to find a community, if you want to feel hope, if you want to feel a sense of a solution, uh, please join. And I'm so happy that you're even here. That's a great start, I think. <laughs> find this. Yeah, I would like to step away from the economic systems and all that and just to really, uh, you know, have the essence of this just, you know, I would recommend that everybody just goes out and if you're fortunate enough to have wilderness around you, just go out and have a spiritual experience in nature and just remember what, what ecocide in its essence is about. Mm, thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to pick up on the question on degrowth because I, I agree that that's the long-term goal. We need to confine our activities within planetary boundaries and, and uh, endless growth isn't that. Uh, but that's like a marathon, getting there, changing all of the big systems. It's going to take a lot of time. Uh, but on that way, we can have markers. We can do sprints in between. One of these sprints is getting ecocide recognized as an international crime. Uh, and it's, it's part of what will build up to the final goal because uh, we change norms through law. And if we change international law, we change even bigger norms. So uh, it's something that's inevitable to happen, I think. Uh, but it's also like a short-term uh, obtainable goal in a world where we have, like, we have everyone in civil society burning out because we're always fighting endless fights. Now, now we have one we can just get over with and then move on to the next one. Thank you. Sure. Um, 
if I focus just on what we can do here in Iceland and in the Nordic countries in terms of ecocide, uh, how, how we can build the legal framework and how we get the legislators uh, to finish this. Uh, I think raising awareness uh, about the concept, what does it mean, and what, more importantly, even what does it not mean, mm -hmm. uh, and how wonderfully easy it is to, to, to finish that uh, and, and then use it. And it's one of the quick, you know, it's almost like a quick fix in this huge, enormous uh, challenge we stand before. Uh, so it's, uh, I think, you know, go out there and, and, and you know, young people are, are there. We, we have to have, the, from the very early age, the education must uh, be amongst uh, the, the uh, elderly ones, and, and we just need to go out there and start talking about it. Thank you. Or continue, rather. Mm. Bala. My plea as the grandmother on this panel <laughs> is that we give nature rights, uh, that we give Mother Earth rights in front of the law, because at the moment, people and corporations have rights, but Nature has no rights, and that's why we keep destroying it. So ecocide law is absolutely a key step to give nature rights. Thank you, Jojo. Yeah, I think I think um, the relationship between rights and and the rights sphere in the criminal law sphere is really interesting here, and particularly given that there's a lot of talk at the moment around the new. Um, uh, UN acknowledged right to a clean health and uh, healthy and sustainable environment. Um, you know, our basic human right is the right to life. But our right to life is protected by the fact that to take that life is a crime. I mean, you can have a right to life, but if murder isn't a crime, your right's not worth very much. And so effectively, we can think of ecocide law as being a kind of, the, you know, the protective side, you know, the, 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 the balance, the, 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 the complement to the right to a clean and and, and sustainable environment. So I, th I think it, I think it, you're absolutely right to bring up that that relationship because it's 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 so clear when you think of it in those terms. Um, and I think again, I wanted to, I, I wanted to pick up on um, a lot of people sometimes latch onto this and sort of go, oh, this is going to solve all environmental problems. You know, like it's some kind of silver bullet. It's not. But what it can do is make everything else easier. So, you know, the fact that existing environmental crimes are actually up there with drug trafficking in terms of how profitable they are, and yet they're practically not addressed at all in comparison in terms of investigation and reporting. But if you name the worst harms as crimes and you put that foundational piece in place, you start that paradigm shift where people start taking the whole environmental damage thing much more seriously. So, and, and of course, it's, so, it's funny as well how you were saying about how politicians are wary because of the economic sector, but in fact, the voices we're hearing from the investment world are saying, please, guys, legislate for ecocide. Mm -hmm. you know, they, because for them, that's about managing risk. That's about certainty. That's about actually dealing in a commensurate way with the problem that we're facing. So, you know, I think there's a kind of reassurance that can also be issued here that actually this is wanted. This is actually being asked for by the investment world. I think it's, it's something that, you know, perhaps politicians don't need to be so frightened. Um, and finally, how do you get involved? Well, you know, go to stopecocide.earth. There's an act now menu as long as my arm. There's many <laughs> different things that you can do, but ultimately, with any of those things, this word does have potency, which is what's been talked about. So the conversation about ecocide has a life to it. Um, and, and I think this also speaks back to what Andres was saying. There is an appetite for this. There is an appetite for this across the world and in the general public. We were gifted a survey last year. In, it, this is in the UK, so it's an example of a wealthy country. And over 50% of people who'd never heard of it before thought ecocide law was a good idea. I think it was 53% or something. And it was much higher once they'd heard more about it. But when, when the, the, the professional outfit that did this survey said that to us, we said, what, only 53%? <laughs> and, they said, and they said, look, you don't understand. Most of our clients, like 90-something percent of our clients, would literally give their right arm 
to get results like you're getting on the first question. Mm -hmm. And that shows you how ready the public is to support this. It's just a question of them understanding it, hearing about it. So let's tell them. Yeah, and let's continue the conversation outside of this room, for us in the room. And for you who have been online, thank you so much for following. Thank you, the Nordic House, for amazing hosting. Thank you to our technicians. Thank you to our amazing panel. And thank you to the whales and the sea and the whole of the living systems that are keeping us alive and healthy. Thank <laughs> you.